in today's video, anti-cyclone bay canisters. This video is one that I wanted to make, not only because of its historic importance, but also atrocities like this still take place. During this video you will get a voiceover only. I didn't think it was really respectful to talk into a camera while visiting a former concentration camp, as if I was some fancy YouTuber. After a short visit to the administration building located at the main road, it's a walk through an open field. It immediately strikes you how big this concentration camp really was. Buildings that are standing here at the moment are only a small part of all buildings the Germans constructed over the years. As it is now a museum, not everything you see is as it was during the time it was in use. But numerous very grim pieces of evidence of the past have been preserved. In the years 1941 to 1944, a German concentration camp, Konzentrationslager Lublin, was located here, with its seven gas chambers, two wooden gallows, and a total of some 227 structures on site, it was one of the biggest Nazi concentration camps. In total, some 80,000 prisoners perished here. The camp was captured by the Soviet army on July 22, 1944, during Operation Bagration. They came in so fast that the German SS didn't have enough time to destroy it, let alone incriminating evidence of war crimes that were committed here. The Germans didn't even manage to destroy the cremation ovens, which ominously were built on a higher location at the camp, looking out over it. These concrete rollers were used to flatten and compact the soil and substrate materials used for the main roads on the campsite. They were operated by Jews from the Lublin ghetto, which were almost always severely malnourished and almost unable to complete any work. Many of them would die because of this forced labor. All these barracks you see on the right side of the road had specific functions. Some were used by camp management, but most of them were prisons and gas chambers. As the camp expanded over time, some barracks would be assigned different functions. The final solution, a euphemism used by the Germans to describe their systematic extermination program, was not only systematic murder, but systematic plunder. Before the victims were gassed at Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, Czernow, Majdanek and Auschwitz-Birkenau, the SS confiscated all their belongings. First to go was money and other valuables, clothes were next. This mass pillage yielded mountains of clothing. Auschwitz, Birkenau and Majdanek together generated nearly 300,000 pairs of shoes. Part of them were distributed among German settlers in Poland and among the inmates of other concentration camps. This final solution produced over 2,000 freight carloads of stolen goods. This barrack was used to house prisoners. This wooden structure barely protected against the elements with gaping holes in the floors and walls. When walking around and reading the information signs on the walls, you can almost feel the cold creeping onto you. Operation Reinhardt, in German Aktion Reinhardt, was the codename of a German plan in the Second World War to exterminate Polish Jews in the general government district of German-occupied Poland. This deadliest phase of the Holocaust was marked by the introduction of extermination camps. As many as 2 million Jews were sent to Belzec, Sobibor and Treblinka to be murdered in purpose-built gas chambers. In addition, facilities for mass murder using Cyclon Bay were developed at about the same time here at Majdanek concentration camp, Auschwitz II Birkenau, near the earlier established Auschwitz I camp for ethnically Polish prisoners. On October 30, 1941, SS and police leader Odilo Globocznik, headquartered in Lublin, received an order from Himmler to begin the construction of the first extermination camp at Belzec in occupied Poland. This first camp was operational from March 17, 1942. Operation Reinhardt ended in November 1943. Most of the staff and guards were then sent to northern Italy for further operations against Jews and local partisans. We are making our way to the sleeping barracks on a separate part of the concentration camp. 
these so-called fields were all fully separated from each other by barbed wire lines and security towers. Reconstructions of those are giving a pretty good feeling on how tight security here was. The sleeping barracks are just as bad as the previous barracks we have seen, with large holes in the walls and floors and bunk beds tightly packed together. No mattresses as well, just a layer of thin felt is all the prisoners here were given during most likely the last beds they would ever sleep in. As at least 78,000 people are confirmed to be exterminated here, with the total suspected amount almost double that. Yes, that's only for the Maidenek concentration camp. Only this site we were visiting today. The name Maidanek is a nickname from locals that means Little Maidan, referring to the Jewish ghetto of Maidan Tatarski in the town of Lublin, conveniently located directly next to the concentration camp. The Soviet occupiers managed to make the area into a museum within a few months of their arrival. But that was not before they used parts of the camp as their own filtration camp. The communist Soviet military information and counterintelligence operated here to select and deport disarmed soldiers from the Polish army to deep into the Soviet Union or to forcefully conscript them into the Polish Communist Army. In the distance, still on the same side and on top of a slight slope, is the crematorium of Majdanek. Tens of thousands of bodies were cremated here as soon as their death sentences were executed. This is a replica of the Column of the Three Eagles, designed by prisoners on the order of camp management. The prisoners decided to secretly commemorate the victims of the camp through their creation. We are making our way to the actual gas chambers. Walking the same path constructed by forced labor of prisoners of the camp as thousands of prisoners did decades ago. The only difference is that nowadays people walk out of this so-called bathing and disinfection barracks. Prisoners were stripped of all the possession, including the basic clothing they arrived in at the camp. If you were to enter these doors as a prisoner, there was one guarantee. You would die by poison gas in the next few minutes. DSS not only used carbon dioxide to suffocate their prisoners, but also a powerful poison gas with the infamous brand name of Cyclam B. This was a cyanide-based pesticide that was developed in Germany in the 1920s, after the original pesticide was discovered in California in the 1880s already. Hydrogen cyanide was the poison gas, which was canned with an eye irritant as a warning that the poison gas was released. The walls of the gas chamber here in Majdanek still have a blue color to it, because of the frequent use of Cyclone Bay. It is however completely safe to enter the room now and it's also open to visitors of the museum. If you thought it wouldn't get any worse than systematically killing humans on an industrial scale, you are completely wrong. Because the Germans were very thorough in their job and cleaned up after themselves as good as they could back then. This is indeed the crematorium, where tens of thousands of executed prisoners of Majdanek concentration camp were cremated in order to get rid of as much evidence as possible. Because Germans are and were meticulous to make sure everything was done in a proper way, even final disposal of those executed because they were seen as Untermensch, subhumans, as Nazi Germany regularly referred to if talking about Jews and Slavs. This is the very room where the bodies of freshly executed prisoners were kept as the crematorium had to run at full speed to get rid of the evidence the SS created here on a daily basis. Not only Jews were exterminated here, a mixed bag of anything that the Germans didn't like was brought here to be gassed in the gas chambers or simply executed.
this uh, effects room, of course, is another euphemism thought up by Nazi Germany. This is where deceased personal effects were catalogued and reported back to Berlin. It is no secret though that those working at the camps love to take their share before reports on what actually has been seized were made or even sent out. This barracks is now dedicated to a huge timeline of events of the Maidenek concentration camp, starting with its inception by Heinrich Himmler in mid-1941, its construction that followed soon after that and also the numerous expansions of the death camp. Originally, the camp was built to house some 50,000 prisoners, but this had to be expanded to 150,000 soon after as Nazi Germany was ramping up their Holocaust efforts. As many parts of Europe fell into German hands, they had no shortage of people selected to be sent here to never come home. In late July 1944, just three short years after its inception, soldiers of the Soviet army entered the town of Lublin and also liberated this camp. Only then the scale of the crimes against humanity that took place here were revealed. I'll leave you here walking towards the exit of Maidanek concentration camp in the city of Lublin, in southeastern Poland. The freedoms we currently enjoy were slowly forged here and started all the way back in Western France when the Allied forces started their liberation of Europe on the beaches of Normandy in 1944.